It is my great pleasure to welcome as our commencement speaker, Anne Costello. Anne is the director of the Galasano Foundation, one of the nation's leading philanthropic organizations and the leading foundation dedicated to helping individuals with intellectual disabilities. Anne has more than 30 years of service in the nonprofit sector in human service administration, strategic planning, fund distribution, and organizational policy development. She joined the foundation as director in 1999, redefining the foundation's role in the disability service arena as a productive partner and catalyst for transformation. Under her leadership, the foundation has supported and launched innovative partnerships and programs. These include the Institute for Innovative Transition to Improve Transition Services for Young Adults with Intellectual Disabilities, the first Healthy Athletes Regional Training Program to train clinical directors to screen Special Olympic athletes, and media campaigns to end the R word and move to include. Move to include partners with WXSI PBS to build a more inclusive community by inspiring and motivating people to embrace different abilities and include all people in every aspect of community life. Anne is a key participant in the advancement of the Special Olympics Global Healthy Communities Initiative launched in 2012 with a $12 million gift from Tom Galasano to expand health-related services to people with intellectual disabilities. Anne's work with the Galasano Foundation can also be seen on the Roberts Wesleyan College campus in the funding of our beautiful library and in our Bridge to Le Living and Learning, our Bell Certificate Program designed for individuals with intellectual disabilities, giving our campus the opportunity to partner with multiple organizations in the greater Rochester area to make a difference in the lives of others. Anne earned her Bachelor of Science from Buffalo State College and her master's degree from the University of Pennsylvania School of Social Policy and Practice and also served as a research fellow at the school's city and regional planning. On behalf of all the residents of the Rochester region, I thank you, Anne, for all you do for the community. And I also extend a warm welcome to Anne's husband, Tony, who is with us today. Please join me in welcoming to our podium, Anne Costello. Good morning, President Porterfield, Board of Trustees, faculty, graduates, and families. I am truly honored to speak with you this morning. Let me begin, begin by extending a warm welcome to Robert's new president, President Porterfield, who came, as you know, a long way from sunny California. But I probably don't need to remind her of that given the temperature outside today. I hope that you continue to enjoy our crisp winter mornings for many years to come, Dina. Congratulations to the families and graduates. This is a day of celebration for your hard work and accomplishments. Class of 2014, you are now part of Roberts Wesleyan College's long, proud history, actually celebrating 150 years in 2016. Let's give that and you a round of applause. You are graduating from a college that believes, and I quote, the best education addresses the person in his or her entirety as a physical, psychological, social, rational, and spiritual being, a college dedicated to education of character. Graduates and families, with that kind of commitment, I say you've been in very good hands the past few years. I've had the pleasure of being associated with Roberts for a number of years, going back to 1985, when I worked closely and in several capacities with Dr. Bill Dakota, chair of the social work department. Bill served as a volunteer on a United Way committee that I staffed, and he later recruited me to serve on the newly formed community advisory committee, charged with developing the first MSW degree program in 1996. As you know, the MSW program did achieve accreditation, which is no easy feat, 
and continues to be an important option for area students today. I also work closely with my boss, Tom Golisano, on the vetting and ultimate approval of the beautiful library that graces your campus. That library has received several well-deserved merit awards, as well as LEED Silver Certification from the U.S. Green Building Council. As Dina said, more recently, I've been actively involved in the Bell Program, a post-secondary program for students with intellectual disabilities that has gained national recognition thanks to the leadership and commitment of former President Dr. John Martin and now the tender loving care of Dr. David Bassinger, Kim Woodard, and their team. And as a matter of fact, many of my colleagues in the community are graduates of Roberts Wesleyan College. And when I was at United Way, I encouraged two of my staff members to enroll and complete the Masters of Organizational Management program. So as you can see, I'm no stranger to this fine institution. Today I want to talk to you about three things that I've learned through the years that I hope will inspire you as you embark on this next chapter in your life. One is to always imagine the possibilities, to look at the big picture. Two. Since you already know that not one person can save the world, you must find your role, the part you're going to play. And three, be on the inside. Don't be on the outside looking in. So big picture. We don't have to look too far to find examples of someone who sees or saw the big picture. We have two individuals in our own backyard who stand apart. I've had the good fortune for the past 15 years to work for a man who imagines the possibilities, a man who sees opportunities, not obstacles, a man who sees the big picture. Tom Golisano imagined a more efficient way to process payroll for small business. He saw that a huge potential market, the 98% of American businesses with fewer than 100 employees, was being ignored by the payroll processors of the day. So in 1971, with $3,000 and a big picture, he founded the company Paychex. Now his billion dollar company serves approximately 570,000 payroll clients and pays one out of every 15 American private sector employees. Tom also imagined a more caring, kind, accepting world for his son, who was born with intellectual disabilities. He imagined a life in which disability does not define who you are, what you do, or where you can go. Since 1985, Tom and the Golisano Foundation have embodied the concept of the big picture by supporting innovative and creative projects that address the present and future needs of people with individual with individuals with ID as they take their rightful place in the community right alongside of us. Another example of someone who saw the big picture is Benjamin Titus Roberts, the founder and visionary of this respected center of, in, of education. The year was 1866, right after the Civil War, a war that ensued as a result of our leaders lacking the big picture. Reverend B. Thomas Roberts started this school to train young people to become servant leaders with high moral character. That Roberts saw the big picture is exemplified by his opposition to slavery, the opposition of the poor, and his support of workers' rights and the rights of women to vote. And remember, this was 1866. His vision of transforming the world through teaching, through seeing the big picture, is memorialized through the expectation of those of you who are gathered here today. I don't know if you know this, but the popular usage of the term big picture can be traced back to 1904 at a time of the incubation of the motion picture industry. A new crop of innovative directors realized that having minute details in focus was important, but the overall composition of the scene and the story, in other words, the big picture, was as important. I've been lucky in my position at the foundation to be given both the opportunity and the privilege to set the stage, audition the characters, apply some make and makeup, position the props, I've even gotten to yell action to the cast and watch the big picture emerge. So now you have the dream. What role will you play in making it a reality? Noted civil rights activist Harry, 
Harriet Tubman said, and I quote, every great dream begins with a dreamer. Always remember you have within you the strength, the patience, and the passion to reach for the stars to change the world, end quote. In other words, if you can imagine it, you can forge the path to make it become a reality. Peter Drucker, guru of modern management, advises the ability to pause, connect with one's values, and differentiate between doing the next thing right and doing the next right thing is one of the most important leadership skills we must learn. Let me repeat that. The ability to differentiate between doing the next right thing and doing the next thing right is the most important leadership skill we must learn. So take time to be self-reflective. That will help you find the role you should play and that you will enjoy doing. I'm still honing my craft because learning is a lifelong journey. But you know what? I know I'm on the right path. And I know it because there isn't a day that goes by that I don't feel exhilarated about what I'm doing, even though problems sometimes feel insurmountable. I can embrace those challenges that will continue to present themselves because I know that I am in a part that I am destined to play. <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't know about you, but I've always found the experience of astronauts to be most profound in this way. Each and every one of them who have viewed the Earth from space have experienced something called the overview effect. It's the sudden recognition that we live on a planet. Now that sounds simple enough, doesn't it? But here's the catch. The experience transforms a person's perspective of Earth and mankind's place on it, and he or she begins to think of it more as a shared home. Apollo astronaut Jim Irving captured it with this description. As we got further and further away, the Earth diminished in size. Finally, it shrank to the size of a marble, as beautiful as you can imagine. That warm, beautiful, living object looked so fragile, so delicate, that if you touched it with a finger, it would crumble and fall apart. Seeing this has to change a man. Well, I don't think many of us in the audience have been in space, but each of us occupies one. A space where we are mindful and sensitive to the fragility, the flaws, and fissures of the world around us. A space in which we are reminded that all of us have potential, the opportunity, and the responsibility to make some change to fortify the planet, the community, or an individual. Years ago, my father gave me sage advice when I was setting out to save the world, embarking on the journey to figure out the role I would play in my career and in life. I grew up in rural Wayne County in a small town, Clyde, New York. My father sold farm machinery. He was a man of deep, deep faith. He told me, Anne, in order to make a difference, you need to be on the inside, not the outside looking in. Over the years and through my work with Tom and the Foundation, I have been fortunate to be on the inside in arenas throughout the world that have helped me develop key partnerships and focus and shape the role I can play. I've had the distinct honor of dining with the former president of Malawi, of meeting US presidents and first ladies, working with CEOs of trusted global NGOs like UNICEF, Save the Children, and the International Federation of Red Cross, and strategizing on global issues with corporate CEOs and heads of large foundations. I've listened to humanitarians such as Bono, Dr. Paul Farmer, and Malala, the most recent Nobel Prize recipient, the youngest to ever receive the, the award, talk about human rights violations and diseases of extreme poverty. And I've been in the company of other Nobel Prize laureates, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, and witnessed up close and personal the inner glow and radiant peace of Burma's civil rights activist, Aung San Suu Kyi. Being on the inside has expanded my universe of knowledge and deepened my understanding of people's needs. I have seen firsthand that I am, have the capability to help improve humanitarian problems if we work together. And it has given me hope, inspiring me even more to imagine the possibilities. But here's something else I learned along the way. 
And this is very important and a point I want to underscore. The famous and the celebrated nothing over the Special Olympic athletes, such as the team from Syria and Libya, who took top medals in the snowshoe competition at the World Winter Games in Pyeongchang, South Korea, or the unified soccer college soccer teams with disabled and non-disabled players traveling and competing throughout the state of New Jersey. Let me back up a minute in case you missed. Snowshoe competition, teams from Syria and Libya, they actually train on sand, which is harder to train on. So when they come to events, they're way ahead of the competition, and that's why they took the gold and silver medal in the snowshoe competition. Many years ago, American sports writer Haywood Brown made the observation that sports don't build character, they reveal it. One only has to look at the legions of Special Olympic athletes to understand and appreciate this. My personal life now involves working with wonderful human beings who are labeled disabled. Yet I have found these individuals to be some of the most abled, open, and insightful human beings I have ever met. And I've been honored and humbled to meet their parents as well, who are very special human beings themselves. So what about people like those with intellectual disabilities who all too often are on the outside looking in? Who invites them to the table to be part of the club, to have a shot at making a difference? The more I see people who have no voice, the more important it becomes for me and others who do have a voice to use it. Once you are on the inside, once you've built the right partnerships, find your role and imagine the possibilities, you not only have the ability but the responsibility to put that access, vision, and empowerment to work. I recently had lunch with President Porterfield, and she asked me, what are my dreams for people with intellectual disabilities, and how can the college help realize those dreams? I think that she, and that question, ranks right up there with the other great visionaries that we've talked about today. She didn't ask me what the foundation was working on or what is its mission. She asked me what I dream for people with intellectual disabilities and how can the college help. I told her the college can continue, that the college must continue to prepare future generations of clinicians, teachers, social workers, business leaders, every every degree, every area of study, to have the skill, expertise, and compassion to guide people and families through the complex maze of service systems within which they will probably spend most of their lives. That Roberts graduates will give families a voice, the voice they need to advocate for their loved ones when obstacles and disrespect comes their way. So to summarize, I urge you one, to look at the big picture, like Tom Golisano, Reverend B.T. Roberts, and President Porterfield. Take a bird's eye view. Think about your dream. Start there and figure out what part you will play. Two, get inside. Help make it happen. It'll take a road map, the right partners, connections, and a never-ending passion and focus. In other words, don't settle. Three, Remember, one person can't save the world, so find out the part you can play. In closing, I have a confession to make. I was born and raised a Catholic. Yes, it's true. Card-carrying member. <laughs> and many of you in the audience probably know that Catholics are not very good at reading the Bible or interpreting the stories or passages as they relate to everyday life. Catholics are taught to take those miracles quite literally and don't ask any questions. The good news is I'm getting a lot better at this, thanks to my dear friend Mary Warboys Turner, who happens to be a member of the Board of Trustees here at Roberts and the granddaughter of one of the early founders of the college. So see, you have a celebrity in the audience. Every morning with my coffee, I read the email Mary sends me called Encouragement for the Day from Proverbs 31 Ministries. A recent encouragement is appropriate for our conversation today. That encouragement is as simple as it is hard. Stop and pray, or SAP, S-A-P. 
According to Webster, sap, like nourishment that flows through the tree, when used as a noun, is defined as energy and vitality. By making prayer a priority, we can revive our spirits and restore the physical and mental energy we need to overcome every challenge. So as we try not only to do the right thing, but to do what is right, as we dig deep and try to be true to ourselves, as we imagine the possibilities, look at the big picture and identify the role we each will play, as we remind ourselves that we're not too small or insignificant to make a difference, be sure to stop and pray in whatever way has meaning for you. Graduates, on this day that you and your professors, your families and friends graduate to celebrate your achievements, on behalf of everyone who has, by both teaching and by example, provided you with a moral and character-based education, I wish you much continued success and the ability to see for yourself the clarity and merits of capturing life with the big picture. And finally, if you remember only one thing from my remarks today, I hope it's this, to always train on sand. Thank you very much. <laughs>